despite the fact that the government says to drink three glasses of milk a day for adults and two for kids, there's really no scientific basis for that. If I handed you a beverage, right, that uh, would cause you to gain weight, cause bloating, acne, gas, allergies, eczema, make your bones brittle, maybe even cause cancer, would you drink it? Would you chug three cups of that liquid every day and give two cups to your children? Well, probably not. <laughs> and yet that's exactly what the federal government tells us to do and that milk is the perfect food for Americans and they should drink it daily, three glasses to be exact, in spite of a large and growing body of research that shows its lack of benefits and potentially awful side effects. Now, I agree, it is nature's perfect food, but only if you're a calf, <laughs> okay? So even though milks uh, today, cow's milk particularly, contains dozens of reproductive hormones, allergenic proteins, antibiotics, growth factors, growth hormone like bovine growth hormone, um, some of which, by the way, are known to promote cancer, the dairy industry wants us to believe that their cows are happily producing milk and grazing through green pastures. For the most part, it couldn't be further from the truth. So today we're going to talk about why dairy is such a contentious food, how to tackle the pros and cons of whether it belongs in your diet, and maybe which dairy is okay to eat. Now, here's the truth. Now, I, I wrote a book called Food Fix where I went deep into the machinations of the food industry, the collusion between government and the food industry. And by the way, you know, uh, there's a lot of revolving doors. So people from the Dairy Council work for the government and go back to work for the Dairy Council. And it's a, it's just a it's kind of a mess. Now, big dairy is really behind the headlines that milk is good for you. Um, the, it's a $47 billion a year industry. It's one of the most influential food lobbyists on Capitol Hill. Um, according to the Center for Responsive Politics, which is a nonpartisan group that tracks money in politics, the dairy industry gave nearly $46 million to politicians between 1990 and 2016. In 2015, uh, the Committee of Scientific Experts that Shapes the Dietary Guidelines included two members with financial ties to the big dairy. Furthermore, the dairy industry spent millions of dollars funding studies that claim that milk offers benefits like weight loss, improved health, and stronger bones. Now, <laughs> I'll just tell you a quick story. Years ago, I was on Martha Stewart's television show, which no longer exists, and we were talking about optimal performance and health, and I was one of the experts. Now, when you're an expert on a TV show, you don't get cue cards. You got to know your stuff and you got to just say what you got to say when you got to say it. Now, there was a trainer that she had. I think it was her trainer that was also on the show. And when I talked to the producer, he was talking about the segment and he said, well, we're going to talk about how dairy is this great sports drink. And I said, wait a minute, where are you getting that information? <laughs> he says, well, I said, listen, here, let me send you a bunch of papers. So I went through PubMed and I, I sent him all the papers showing that this is not true. And I also showed, showed them the papers that said it was true, but they were all funded by the Dairy Council. Now, when a, a food industry uh, organization or agency or a council funds a study, it's eight to 50 times more likely to show a positive benefit. In other words, if Coca-Cola does a study on soda, it's going to find that it doesn't cause obesity. Or if the Dairy Council does a study on milk, it's going to find it's good for your bones and it's good for exercise and everything else. But, but actually... Um, it's it's pretty frightening. So anyway, I was in this show, and uh, the trainer had these cue cards by the camera. There were these giant cue cards, which had all the talking points, uh, which were all wrong about why a a dairy is a perfect post-workout food. And I was like, whoa, why are you doing this? She said, well, the producer said, well, the Dairy Council is funding the segment of the show. And I was just flabbergasted. So we think we're getting straight up information. We're just not. First of all, um, we, we need to know this. The whole Got Milk campaign, you know, the mustache thing where you had all the you know, health and human services secretary, all the athletes, all the celebrities, you know, wearing the milk mustache. That was funded in part by the government, something called the Checkoff Program and the Dairy Council. And it was promoting all these claims like it's great for your bones and it's great for this and it's great for that, but it's not. And so the... Um, Federal Trade Commission actually made them take the ads off the air and out of magazines. That's why you don't see them anymore, because there was no scientific basis for the claims, and it was false advertising. So this is a government literally funding millions of dollars to tell us stuff that wasn't scientifically true. So anyway, the, the bottom line here is that milk is not good for your bones. 
and you don't need milk for strong bones. Everybody knows we need milk for stronger bones, right? That's what we're taught. Drink your milk, grow big and strong and tall. You need calcium. And without it, children won't grow up to be big and strong. Adults will get hip fractures, and most people would be um, getting osteoporosis, and their bones will crumble to dust as they age. But there's absolutely no evidence that we need milk to strengthen our bones. And, and for example, countries with the lowest milk consumption have the lowest rates of osteoporosis and fractures, while those with the highest dairy consumption and calcium have the highest rates of fractures. How do you make sense of that? Uh, in fact, uh, in one study, they found that, that those who drank more milk had higher risk of fractures. So that it's a bit concerning to me. Um, also, um, it's good for your kids, right? I mean, we now force kids to have milk. If you want to have a school lunch program, you have to serve milk. And most of it's sugary milk, which is basically like a soda and milk together. Uh, and it's mandated by the government that in public schools, we have to have milk. But, you know, kids can't get their federal school lunch money unless they give, I'm sorry, the schools can't get their federal, uh, federal school lunch money unless they give every kid milk. Uh, but there's no evidence that it's, it's true. In fact, they're also giving them low fat milk, which is even worse because low fat milk actually uh, causes them to gain more weight because it makes them not feel satisfied or full from the fat. Also, milk is a lousy source of calcium. Uh, the studies are pretty clear on this. There's nothing special about dairy and bone health. Uh, in fact, the vitamin D that we get with milk, that's added to the, uh, the milk. It's not actually naturally in milk, believe it or not. Uh, they put it in there to prevent rickets, which is a good thing, but still, it's not where we get vitamin D. Uh, the amount of calcium everybody needs is actually far less than the levels recommended in the United States. It's not actually the total calcium intake that matters, but how much you actually keep. For example, you know, in Africa, they might have 300 milligrams of calcium intake in their diet, but they have very good bones and strong health, but they only lose maybe 200 milligrams of calcium. So their net is 100 milligrams of calcium a day. Whereas in America, we might take in 1500 milligrams, but we might lose 16 or 1700 milligrams because of all of our bad habits. For example, if you smoke cigarettes, if you eat sugar, if you drink soda, which has phosphoric acid, it's like leeches out your bones. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> oh my God, I was, uh, I was buying, uh, I was buying some uh, ribs in, uh, for a barbecue we were having the other day. And at my local butcher. And uh, I said, well, how do you kind of make them? What do you do? He says, well, first you want to soak the ribs in Coca-Cola. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, because it helps dissolve the fibers and soften up the meat and get it off the bone. I'm like, wow, okay. I don't think I want to do that. Um, also, stress causes you to lose calcium, caffeine, alcohol, uh, uh, excess salt, all cause us to lose calcium. We're doing a lot of things, plus being sedentary causes us to lose calcium. So we live a lifestyle that causes calcium loss. We gotta stop that. So we need to also think about not just how much we're taking in, but how much we're losing. Next, we need to think about where can we get calcium from in our diet besides milk? And in fact, uh, there actually you can get a lot of calcium from things that don't have hormones, that don't have allergens, that don't have all kinds of antibiotics in them, and all kinds of crap. So let's talk about, for example, how some common foods stack up to about four ounces of cow's milk, which is about 138 milligrams of calcium. First of all, sesame seeds. A quarter cup of sesame seeds, tahini is an amazing thing. You can make dressing out of it. I make like miso tahini dressing I put on my uh, vegetables. So there's lots of ways to include tahini and sesame seeds. But a quarter cup has 350 one milligrams, which is almost, uh, I'm not good with math, but more than twice the amount uh, that, that milk has. Sardines, uh, a little can of sardines has, with the bones, which sounds weird, but you can actually eat the bones, has 300, also 50 milligrams of calcium. Tofu, which is three and a thousand, has 350 milligrams of calcium. Yogurt, which is obviously dairy, uh, but you can get it from sheep or goat, has 250, 96 milligrams. Collard greens, which, by the way, these may be better utilized and absorbed by the body, has about 268 milligrams. Spinach has 245 milligrams in a cup. Cheese, which is another dairy product, has a little less, 204. Uh, sockeye salmon, three ounces with the bones in them, 188 milligrams. Almonds, dry roasted, have a, a two ounces, have about 150. So basically, from two ounces of almonds, you get more calcium than you will from milk. Also, chia seeds are another great source of calcium uh, and have way more calcium than milk um, that, than you can get from milk. Um, and by the way, it, it turns out that it's vitamin D that's the most important for actually helping our bones, not so much calcium. Milk also may increase your risk of cancer. Um, now, in a, in a very important editorial in JAMA Pediatrics in 2013, 
two of the leading uh, nutrition scientists in the world from Harvard, David Ludwig and Walter Willett, called out the federal government for advising three cups daily of low-fat milk for most Americans. Uh, and, uh, you know, these are these are not kind of radical vegans. These are people who work at the top levels of academia who've done extraordinary amounts of research and basically are saying, hey, we got it all wrong about dairy. Uh, as we talked about earlier, milk doesn't promote bone health. Uh, Dr. Willett and, and Dr. Ludwig noted that it actually may promote cancer. That's because uh, milk contains a witch's brew of hormones that may act like miracle grow for cancer cells. For example, the average glass of milk contains 60 different hormones. Now, these are not necessarily hormones that are added to the milk. But think about what is milk? It's basically a growth food. It's designed to grow babies and grow cows. And it's it's got all these growth factors and growth hormones in it, anabolic hormones. But it also doesn't just cause your body to grow in your little, it actually causes cancer cells to grow. So uh, it's kind of bad news. Uh, it also increases something called IGF-1, which is a known cancer promoter, insulin growth factor one. It's also associated with kidney disease, diabetes, heart disease, and, and um, lower levels of people with IGF-1 actually live longer and have lower rates of cancer. But milk pushes your rate, your uh, levels of IGF-1 in the wrong direction. So may have cancer links, maybe increased to prostate cancer and other cancers as well. Also, dairy fat may not be the issue, right? The fat from dairy isn't the issue. It's, it's the casein and the other uh, hormonal compounds in the milk. Um, the government guidelines basically say that we shouldn't really tell people to drink milk, but they specifically recommend low fat or fat free versions because of a longstanding misguided view that saturated fat is the boogeyman for heart disease. Now, Saturated fat uh, actually may be really good for some people, although maybe not others, but but for most people, it's actually okay, particularly people with metabolic issues, diabetes, and so forth. And there's been you know troves of research that showed that it's, it's not the boogeyman we thought it was. It, and actually, the dairy fat may be better. In fact, there was an article called Butter is Back in uh, one of the major medical journals, I think American Journal of Cardiology, where they actually, uh, and I'll get into that in a minute, um, so that it was actually quite helpful for people with, with diabetes and prevention and so forth. But uh, there was a big review of saturated fat. And I wrote a lot about this in my book, Eat Fat, Get Thin. So if you want to learn more about it, you can go ahead and read that book. But there was a, a huge landmark review published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, one of the major medical journals in 2014, that looked at 72 of the most rigorous studies on dietary fat and heart disease, including two dozen randomized controlled trials, which are hard to do, and also population studies, blood studies. And they found that saturated fat and total fat consumption have very little effect to no effect on heart disease. Um, they found that actually trans fat was a bad one, but... Uh, that was for sure bad, so we don't want trans fat. But they found that actually people having the fats from dairy actually had lower cardiovascular risk. Also, other studies have shown this as well for diabetes. Those with higher levels of the saturated fat from dairy, which is a different kind of saturated fat, actually have lower risks of diabetes. So, you know, butter's had a terrible reputation because it's basically just animal fat. Uh, most of it's saturated. Not all of it, by the way. The most, most foods are mixed uh, fat. So monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, saturated. Uh, and the government tells us not to eat butter, right? But uh, about 60% of the fats are saturated fat, 20% monounsaturated, and the rest are poly. But you know, I think butter is, is, is not the enemy number one like we thought it was. It doesn't mean you should eat butter as much as you want. Uh, it's fine to eat it like our grandparents did, have a little butter, have grass-fed butter. Uh, it's fine. Um, it has better fats. It has antioxidants. It has uh, more carotenoids. It has a higher source of CLA, which is a an important conjugated linoleic acid, which boosts your metabolism and help, may help prevent cancer and heart disease. So have a little butter, enjoy it, track your numbers. But some people are super responders to saturated fat. I'm, I might be one of them. So the people who are thin, lean athletes tend to get more uh, saturated fat response for some reason. I think it's genetic. You're going to have it on your veggies. Also, be aware that uh, saturated fat plus sugar and starch are bad combo. So butter on your veggies, put on your fish, protein, no problem. Mixing it with carbs and sugar, not a good idea. So butter and bread, bad idea. Uh, also, if you're going to eat dairy, uh, what should you eat? And let's talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> Grass-fed is really important. And, and reason, the reason is because, uh, one... Uh, it, it it doesn't have the antibiotics, it have the hormones, uh, and it, it 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 has higher levels of phytochemicals in it, better saturated, better fat, fatty acid composition, uh, more antioxidants. So you know it's it's not only what you eat that matters; it's what you're eating 
has eaten. Right? So cows graze on the natural diet of grass. They produce milk and meat with better fat composition and nutrients than those fed corn and grain and soy. So if you're going to consume butter or dairy products, remember that grass fed is important uh, or regenerative even better. Organic dairy is somewhere in the middle, right? Because organic could be not grass fed. They could just feed it organic corn or organic soy. And also they, they might have some pasture in their diet, but basically most of their diet comes from organic grains and feed that are you know, better because they're free of pesticides, herbicides, antibiotics, uh, and has more omega, um, um, better six to three ratio, but it's still not great because they can actually milk organic cows while they're, while they're, uh, pregnant, which adds way more hormones and all the natural hormones that are in milk. Um, there's, you know, things you can actually use like probiotic rich dairy, kefir yogurt, they're better, they're better actually, um, in terms of um, tolerance and digestion. Uh, also, you can use ghee or clarified butter, which basically takes all the milk solids, all the casein, all the whey, and uh, and it can be used by people who are even allergic to dairy. Uh, so organic grass-fed ghee is great. Um, it's basically like the uh, Indian form of butter and has lots of nutrients, higher smoke point, and it's great for high heat cooking. Now, uh, I don't really recommend eating that much cow dairy. Now, there, there, there's an important thing to recognize. There's... there's um, different kinds of, of, of casein in, in dairy products. There's A1 casein, A2 casein. Now, A1 casein is what most modern cows have. This is an inflammatory form of casein. That's the protein in milk. And that tends to be linked to more of the issues around milk. A2 casein is from more of the heirloom cows. I think uh, Jersey cows, Guernsey cows have more A2 casein. And there are dairy products like ice creams and others you can get from A2 cows, but they're really hard to find. Uh, and that's better for you. But goat and sheep dairy products are far better, better tolerated, have less inflammatory potential, and have primarily A2 casein. So I'd encourage people to switch over. And I, for example, I can't tolerate regular dairy because I get congested, stomach issues. If I have goat or, or sheep, I'm fine. Goat cheese, sheep cheese, goat yogurt, no problem. So cow's milk can be very inflammatory, can cause eczema, allergies, gut issues, acne, because of this A1 casein. But if you switch to goat and dairy, it's it's better and it, it's better tolerated. Also, uh, the, the goat's milk has high levels of medium chain triglycerides, which help metabolism, brain function, has higher levels of vitamin A, which is great for your skin. And people have more A2 casein, tend to not have as much of the GI symptoms, have less inflammatory biomarkers, they have better cognitive function. So goat or sheep milk can be a great alternative. So what should you look for when you're buying dairy? Well, um, make sure you look for certain certifications that make sure the animals are produced in an ethical manner, right? Animal welfare approved, certified humane, American humane certified, food alliance certified, global animal partnership. These are ways to sort of, you know, find sources of dairy that are better for you. Um, so what, what is possible to eat for dairy? Well, I, I recommend that people avoid for the most part cow dairy, unless it's A2 cows. Uh, pet that are regeneratively raised. And even then, some people still have trouble with, with cow dairy. But a little bit here and there is fine. If you want to have grass-fed, full-fat, unsweetened yogurt, uh, that's okay. Ideally, sheep or goat is better. Uh, kefir is another way to have a dairy product. You can get goat or sheep kefir. Um, whole milk, grass-fed cheese, again, better goat or sheep with no additives. Grass-fed ghee or butter is fine. Um, and if you can get them goat or sheep, I would highly recommend that. What should you avoid? Well, dairy from conventionally raised cows, uh, skim milk, <laughs> 2% milk, low-fat milk, low-fat yogurt, non-fat yogurt, yogurt that has fruit, uh, sweetener additives or anything extra. In fact, you know, uh, Yoplait, which is one of the sort of sweetened yogurts, that has more sugar per ounce than a can of Coca-Cola. So <laughs> it's really bad for you. Don't have that thing you think is healthy, which is your sweetened yogurt in the morning. Um, Avoid the cheeses and so forth made with skim or reduced fat milk. The fat is actually the good part. Also, no processed cheese. I mean, it's not even called cheese. I mean, there's something called, you know, craft uh, American slices. They can't call it cheese because it's less than 50% cheese. It's a cheese-like substance. Um, and, and obviously, don't eat cheese. It comes in a spray can or a squeeze bottle or some weird industrial cheese product. Uh, so anyway, that's the story on dairy. Definitely don't need it. If you want to consume it, try sheep or goat. Sheep or goat. Um, realize it's not nature's perfect food. It doesn't help your bones. It may cause cancer. And there's a lot of reasons to just avoid it. So again, sheep or goat is fine. Try it. See how you feel. Your body is the best 
uh, indicator of what works and what doesn't. Your body's the smartest doctor in the room. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. Reflux is common. It doesn't mean that there's something defective in human design. It means that we're doing the wrong things for our body and our bodies are rebelling. They're clues your body needs to do something different. Your body is calling for your attention and 